Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome. My name is Sarah Odsley, and I am the Writing Across Media Facilitator at Vermont Studio Center, which is a fancy title, but it really just means I manage the writing program, and it is my pleasure to do so. We are located in Northern Vermont in the town of Johnson, and we are a year-round international residency program for visual artists and writers. Um, right now in Johnson, Vermont, uh, things are turning um, into what I call stick season, which means that all the leaves have fallen off the trees and it's um, very brown around here. Um, but our campus is, is stunning. It's beautiful all seasons, all year round, and it's bisected by the Gihon River. Um, and if you come here as a writer, you get to be in the Maverick Studios, which all the studios are oriented to the river and overlook the river. I wanna take a moment to honor and recognize the land um, which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange for indigenous people for thousands of years. And where we are located um, is the unceded territory of the Abenaki people. And we honor and recognize them as the traditional stewards of the land and waters on which we gather. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is a special featured reading series called Writers on the Rise, which is a spotlight reading series designed to uplift and amplify the diverse talent of a wide range of voices and creative visions. And I'm so pleased to say that this reading series is funded by the Rana Jaffe Foundation, which supports women writers um, throughout their careers. I'm very pleased to introduce Neha Sayu Degans, a daughter of the Caribbean diaspora. She is a multi-hyphenate actor, poet, and maker, recently seen off-Broadway, regionally, internationally, and in the ice Tea produced indie feature, Equal Standard. Her pandemic poem, To Find, To Be, was shortlisted for the 2020 Montreal Prize and her first book-length collection of poems, Music for Exile, was published in February 2021 from Tupelo Press. And she was also a resident at Vermont Studio Center. And it is always my pleasure to bring people back who've been here and who've worked on a writing project and then have a book published, and then we can feature them in this, in this way through a special reading. Um, so thank you so much for being here, Neha Sayu and um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for inviting me um, to do this reading. It's deeply meaningful um, having um, enjoyed a month-long residency at Vermont Studio Center. I think I was the inaugural Cave Canem Fellow at Vermont Studio Center, and a couple of the um, poems that are included in this collection and that I'll read tonight were written while I was there. So um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I am zooming in um, from Brooklyn, the unceded lands of the Muncie Lenape, and um, also just sending good energy out to folks who might still be experiencing power outages in parts of New England that experience the Nor'easter. If you're listening to this recording later, welcome and hello. I will begin with, the collection has a proem before the table of contents, and then I'm going to uh, begin uh, reading the poem that actually follows the table of contents. Um, and it's a guzzle. Mutter. I have lost two children, a hand to marry, some change, a few pair of socks, a gathering of blue hydrangeas, what's left but a few pair unmatched socks. I have found some friends, books, available apartments, a discarded rendering of a bathing nude, dresses I have liked and worn, and socks. My niece, S, is a tempestuous yogi, golden, unruly hair, and certain hands. She's always wearing lion socks. On tabernacle mornings in the canine hush and rush of trains, I stare at other women. Pregnant, would I remember to wear socks? Would I borrow my husband's sweatpants, his faded jeans, or cusp my waist in a pink sarong and tuck my hands in socks? To have enough for my own home team, to fill a barn, 
Secondhand prams, consignment bibs. How about those pasoks? A light shoe worn by comic actors in ancient Greek and Roman plays. One, puppets. Two, tourniquets. Three, graffiti on the overpass. School socks. For three days, ice made love to the limbs of trees. It was wondrous. The terminal shuddered to the grounded man. LaGuardia's been socked. In a painting somewhere, a rocking chair, a shaft of golden light, a woman sits immersed, content. She is darning socks. My first childhood home, I have no memory. No basket full of birdies, no wet yarn on the line, just the skunk of sulfur like Diesel's sour sock. The refinery's eternal flame, its canine caramel sweetness, was our oil yard Venus. Yellow flare on a hazy horizon, night's white tear in God's sock. J, you are wisdom's brother, our water boy and drummer. He'll be a man one day. I am crying, I am crying for the love of socks. Today, the sky is freshly laundered. Look how the garments catch the wind. Lay it down, Nehesayu, the wet yarns trundle, the tug and stretch of socks. And I was sharing um, with Sarah, um, and I'll say more about it later, perhaps in the Q&A, that um, I feel like this poem has emerged in the world thanks to Tupelo Press at just the right moment in time. It was actually uh, selected for publication in the fall of 2018. And little did we know that this, um, the scheduled publication date of February 2021 would have it launching in the middle of a pandemic. Um, yes, so uh, the poem, the, the collection rather, treks from the Caribbean to Canada to Point South, Providence, New York, Philadelphia, uh, touching on um, diaspora and Afro-Atlantic connections as well. And that migratory path is one that I have lived, um, though not all of the poems are autobiographical. Uh, this next one um, is an origin poem of a sorts that takes some of its inspiration um, from a Margaret, an early Margaret Atwood poem. Album. Gently weigh, now trouble the blue door embossed with the outline of an island. Parents are an island, dark suit, pillbox hat, square, simple veil. No other family fills the frame. Imagine love's small galaxy, dashikied comrades, glasses lifted, a giggle of champagne. Lift the vellum veil, hush. Put a finger to my mother's dress. Embossed satin, creamy hourglass. Note my father's steady gaze. And in terms of origin poems, the collection also spirals and circles out to um, consider um, histories, herstories on a collective mass scale violences both intimate and collective. And I'd like to, um, I did a reading just last Thursday night at the Rhode Island School of Design, um, where some of the um, faculty there um, are generously um, teaching my book this semester. And I've been in an email exchange with one of those faculty members about a poem that's, that's difficult and um, met with some challenges in the classroom, particularly because it was voiced by and embodied by a person not of color. They were, I think, courageously reading the entire collection aloud in one class and came to this poem, Vortex. And we've had such a meaningful exchange around that encounter. I thought it would be great, since VSC is recording this poem, that there's an online archive of me reading this poem. Um, some trigger warnings, perhaps. This does deal with racialized violence. Um, it does deal with um, an incidence of uh, police violence against uh, a black body. 
and there is some gun violence even though uh, no one was targeted with the 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 um perpetrator slash victim's gun but just some trigger warnings um and maybe we can talk about it in the q a if you have questions for me vortex oh it's also a found poem so there are sections which i'll try to indicate it's clear on the page that are literally excerpted verbatim from a newspaper article i stumbled across vortex and four hours later after Officer Bruce Unger pumped three or four bullets into the erstwhile football star as he ran towards him, it was clear that something was closing on Rogers fast. San Jose Mercury News. This feeling of being hunted persists, even after the hounds are called off, even after your high school's been integrated, even after you rescue your dreams from the pocket of another man's coat. I watched this kid stand flat-footed and throw a football 60 or 70 yards. Some can throw, some are quick as can be, but he had it all. It was amazing to see. The propensity towards flat-footedness among African-American males and some females has been shown to have direct links to class and religious affiliation, categories once defined as laws of natural selection. Flat-footed males and some females have a tendency to choose low-lying occupations, those not requiring flight. They are content, really, to remain in fields where the absence of an arched pedalia facilitates stooping or crouching for long hours at a time. It is a position they find most natural, and while resembling the flight-ready stance of a cat, this squat is a proven position of prayer. Such figures wait in fields of cotton or sugarcane for the outstretched wings of a god to swoop forth and carry them home. Negress is a most logical and etymological evolution of the term pas grande arche or no gross arch in the mixed tongue of the Louisianan Creole. For it was early discovered by men of great science that the large backside of Sarah Bartman, AKA the Venus Hottentot, grew in direct proportion to the flatness of her feet. The body having the genetic capacity to produce only so many curves and hollows consumes this economy economy of arch or marché d'arche in the ample fullness of buttocks and breasts and lips in the protuberant flare of the nose. There is little curvature left for that daintiest of ornaments among European women of the landed class, the foot. Hence, the negress's inability to fit comfortably in the haute couture fashions of her time, thus her propensity to settle into positions where the foot and buttocks are less likely to be called upon to serve the interests of the dreamer. They are most happy when stooped or crouched in a field of industrial sewing machines. Jerome Rogers, having, however, was not one to sit lightly up upon protuberant flares or lack thereof. He was really convinced he could fly. I, Jerome Rogers, hereby will my style and sneakiness to my classmen that look up to me, to my parents' love and my teacher's happiness, I'm gone. Posse one connection, I made it. In the interest of seeking connections, we are probing possible links between posse and pussy and a word of an entirely different species, possum. In the event of the former, our theory that it is anatomy, not class, not power, nor sex, nor gender, that can best explain the marginalization of the Negro in the aerial age will indeed be confirmed. Already it is known that the black woman's vagina, or pussy, in the visceral tongue of the North, East, and West, is considered to be immeasurably larger than that most ambivalent of ornaments among European women of the landed and not so landed classes, the cunt. Should the missing link be found to be possum, one realizes little advancement of our thesis, save one minor detail. Arch-footed European men and some women, pioneers of the landed class, have been known to eat its meat. There is persistence in being the hunted, even after the hounds are called off, even after your high school's been integrated, even after you run, catch a ball, and dream of making it on TV. At Mount Pleasant High School, the coaches were salivating at the prospect of Rogers 
talents. At 426 a.m. Tuesday morning, Roger's mother, Dorothy Cozine, called 911 operators to say her son had a rifle. He was acting strangely. He seemed to think something or someone was after him. There is persistence in being the hunted, even after your neighborhoods integrate, even after the opossum assimilate. Sensorial faculties retain the genetic handprint of the hunter. An overstressed and apparently paranoid Rogers forced the evacuation of more than 200 units at San Jose's Skyway Terrace. He peppered the surrounding apartments with more than 100 rounds from an assault rifle. There is persistence in being the hunted, even after your neighborhoods integrate, even after the hounds are retrained. Ears still prick at the fall of flat feet rising over swampy and mossy terrain. So that was Vortex, which closes the third um, quartet or section of the collection. Um, and I'll switch now to a poem that I finished while I was at um, Vermont Studio Center. It's uh, a New York poem, um, a New York, New Jersey poem, Refuge. Dear disappeared town, the flowers at my window remind someone of you. Say petunias, hear batunia, town of his father's birth. Mornings, my man leaps from my bed to brew mint cardamom tea. Hear see, dear be. His father's found a way to grow fig trees in Newark, New Jersey. In winter, you are safe, burlap cocooned, a smuggled secret in his garage. No hungry warblers, no sudden frosts, nor the Atlantic weight that can slow, nor the Atlantic weight that slows an 80-year-old Palestinian man walking through Manhattan in search of olive oil. He scours bright shelves of the city. Home is a map salvaged purely from memory and the beveled light in his hands. Olive oil as smoke, olive oil as wine, olive oil as desert mosque. Which orchard, which school, which mother, which son? Dear son, come summer he will lift. Dear son, come summer he will lift the trees and place them under your ardor, darning that lost farm with this cramped garden, for there's only one celestial arbor we all live under. He will become master seamstress, desert bee, or pollinating one, for here lies his secret to the ripening of figs in Newark, New Jersey. Prick each fig, every one, with a needle dipped in olive oil. A man crows, brings me tea and smoke. My man crows, brings me tea and smoke, purple fruit from the chain link garden. I graze each coppery plum, say home. Here, Chile, Brazil, Iceland and Jordan, seek the invisible navel. The mouth is a bulldozer, no, our smoke velvet lips warble witness. Join in the map maker's prayer. This orchard, this school, this mother, this son, this fig, this room. No one can say gone is gone, not the disappeared town, not the flowers. Um, and I'll just read two more poems. Take a sip of water. Excuse me. Um, this next one is also a garden a poem of a sorts. It's not in the collection. Um, I wrote it, oh, uh, May of uh, 2020. Yes, time blurs and collapses, but May of 2020. And um, was delighted to have it shortlisted. Um, for the Montreal International Prize. And it is a pandemic poem, but the seed, um, the precipitating incident of the poem actually happened many years earlier in Ghana. Um, while I was there uh, teaching a poetry workshop and had a colleague who was teaching a, 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 a silkscreen workshop. And that colleague and another one went off one evening. 
up into the hills for a ceremony and I chose not to go. Um, and the next morning they had not returned. I awakened and their beds were empty in our shared faculty housing and they had not returned. And, but the garden was full of moths of all of these different sizes and colors. And I had not experienced that on any other morning and it felt somewhat ominous. And that image has stayed with me and I tried writing a, a poem from that incident and then somehow it became a metaphor uh, for the loss uh, that we were all experiencing. Uh, um, spring of 2020. To find to be. Awake now, moths shocking the garden, as if bougainvillea or startled white begonia have taken wing. Beds, count them, in the great room empty. Kith, not yet returned from last night's excursion up into the bush. What if, on a hairpin turn, the earth careens over the crevasse, and now an SOS, sea skies dashiki or morning iridescence, so much like war confetti over the triumphal parade? Stand, watch how the hawk moth hovers, birds hover, grazing fish hover, and you? Does your lovely place treble above mine? Might our dead ride in a car that outthreads the light's green canyon? Might we, its regal toe, like startled glass, pandemic cans, wind, a caution not to cry, not to rattle rose-packed chapels with our grief? But here, the gravel crunch of tires, the tired swinging open of the compound gates, thick, lazy slam of all four doors, and voices like so many bangles bearing souvenirs. Imagine even the children are safe. Cup each one. Touch eager foreheads to your own. Consider what trucks beneath the furrowed wheel. Red dust from the road crushed begonia its crowning toll the heart's earth-bound watery hack unfreight red troubles world wail your cargo home if in the garden nothing but more moths and then i'll close with um the poem that actually closes the collection so in part it's thanks to um, Vermont Studio Center, the gathering place on the lands of the Abenaki next to the Gihon River that the collection found its final poem. It's homecoming. I tend to work in form and not in form and this form is something you would encounter on the page. Um, perhaps um, a, a small town newspaper column. When I was little, uh, my family lived uh, on a small town, in a small town on the northern shore of Lake Huron. Homecoming. White gloved and perched on the rear hood of the chrome hubbed convertible, gleaming white in the Lake Huron sun, I'm one of three girls chosen to be vestal virgins to the altar of white, Diana's maidens to the homecoming queen. Our white stockinged legs and polished white shoes brood statuesque over the rear red leather, our white eyelets shivering, our white ribbons flagging, our white gloved hands waving and waving and waving to the white faces lining the tree-lined streets, lining the small Scottish town. But the hands inside my glove is brown, and the face peeping from the white ruffled neck of my summer white dress is a beautiful hazelnut brown. This is my hometown. My legs, two severe batons, majorette the hot red leather. Even after the crowds thin out and the breeze off the lake picks up, even after the bagpipes keen moan fades, out past the Protestant oaks, out 
past the immigrants' bell-less church with its small brick frame, its gravel driveway, out towards the cornfields, when only Lake Huron, with its lull of tall grasses, and only the perennial pines wave back. I am still waving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for reading those poems. It's such a pleasure to hear them. And um, your sequence was well selected for this evening. Um, I, I always really appreciate a poet who comes with like a set list, you know, so we have an arc of, of both a reading, a listening experience, but also an arc in the, you know, um, in the in the narrative of the way that the poems uh, exist side by side. Yeah, Sayu, I'm wondering if you could describe what it's like to bring a book into the world and what your process was. I think you were touching on this a little bit before we got before we officially started, but I know that it can be a long process from drafting individual individual poems to then sequencing a manuscript and then um, having it come out. If you could describe that process for, for us, that'd be great. Certainly. Well, I tend to work slowly. So individual poems, many of them go through um, a first spill. I'm really grateful for re um, residencies or um, like uh, Vermont, like uh, Kavikanam and Community of Writers, sorry, where we are charged with writing a poem a day. We can only bring a poem written in, in 24 hours to each morning's workshop. And those have been wonderful generative spaces for me. And I often come home with a trove of a first drafts that really because of that sort of wonderful pressure cooker are at a certain place, but then I can return to those first drafts. Vortex, interestingly enough, came on a Thursday morning of a community of writers residency in one full spill. That's a poem that actually has not really been revised since that that first poem, and I can talk more about that. But yeah, so individual poems, yes, several drafts. And then as you say, Sarah, like drafting the collection, and that also went through several drafts and sending it out and re recrafting and sending it out. And then I discovered, because I have two chat books, um, Percussion Salt and Honey, which won the Philbert Prize, and Undressing the River, that um, the Center for Book Arts National Chapbook Prize. And I found that I was able to find the arc of those smaller collections, but I realized that the arc of the book length really was uh, escaping me. So I asked for some help from some fellow poets. And this is a sort of a wonderful story because I sent out this, this, this plea for help with the full book length manuscript attached and didn't hear back from anybody for quite a while quite a while and um, I was busy acting and really had come to a place in 2017 where I thought you know what maybe I can't do both and maybe it's okay to not attempt to do both and I had just finished a performance of Lynn Nottage's Intimate Apparel she's a playwright whose work I deeply admire it's a play I'd long wanted to do and I literally arrived back at the actor housing um, uh, I was up in the Berkshires we were gathered in the kitchen as actors do and you know artists do after a long day's work and I looked down at my email, and there was an email on this thread from a fellow Kaveh Kanem poet, Philip B. Williams, who said, and I quote, Nehesayu, now that I'm a more mature poet, I understand what you're up to. I have some thoughts for you. I really do believe you have a book here. And I was so, I mean, I was just so, so we, we jumped on a Zoom call. This was pre-pandemic. I was already using Zoom. I confess, we jumped on a Zoom call. And he's the one that suggested to me the device of the proem. He said, you know, you can have a proem that comes before the table of contents and teaches your reader how to read your work. And, and then he had a couple of other ideas and I was, went on my walk, you know, up with the pines and then I, and then I realized with my acting schedule, I couldn't get back to the manuscript that summer, that was August of 2017, but I made a commitment to myself that that December holiday break, I sat down and I went back through the manuscript with that insight when I found that Khadija's letter could serve as the proem, the rest of the collection really fell into place. And yes, there were the ultimately, yes, some poems left the collection and some poems entered the collection. And I'm so grateful to Philip's insight. And then I just, Sarah, as I'm sure you, I just then, 
I went and I took all the different first book competitions because so many first books are published, right, in that way. And I just put them in my calendar and I just made a commitment to keep sending. And of course, some objections came and I just kept sending. And uh, Tupelo has long been on my wish list of publishers and I sent um, it in for their July open reading, in the July open reading period and it was selected. So a very long process, but deeply rewarding. And um, I think right timed for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And I love how you were like phoned a friend, <laughs> but that but that friend didn't pick up for a while and then you finally got um, him on the phone. Mm -hmm. that, that's amazing, I love that story. And it makes me feel like, you know, I think, I think it's a fallacy that that writers toil, I mean, we do toil alone by ourselves, but the power of community is so, because, you know, we often can't see a sequence or order because we're too close to our own work. Um, and that, you know, phoning a friend is actually one of the best things you can, could potentially do for yourself. So I have a question. I know you're an actor and also a poet, and, I, and I'm glad to hear that you, you feel like now you don't have to choose, um, I'm, but maybe I'm just uh, implying from what you said. Do you feel like one might inform the other in the way that your relationship to language and having an ear for the way the rhythm is in a screenplay or a script? Do you feel like that there's any crossover for in your writing in between those two different disciplines? Um, yes, definitely. And I was a poet before I became an actor. And it was while I was um, at Brown studying poetry that the MFA playwrights um, said, will you, will you act in my play? And there were sort of low stakes. They just needed bodies and it was language. So my love for language, I definitely know as an actor, I'm really drawn to language rich playwrights. So that there's definitely that crossover. I think, and I've, be I've begun to realize this more and more, that because I'm an actor that works both in contemporary and classical plays, I think there's a part of me that still viscerally, experiencely trusts that heightened language and that verse can communicate truthfully and human to human. Um, and one of my first poetry teachers was actually Sonia Sanchez, who had us writing both in form and not in form. So I think that whole combination um, um, allows me to be, um, to bring my poetic sensibility when I'm working uh, on plays. I'm just now beginning to work on camera, te television and film. Most of my work is still very much on stage. Um, and I think when I return to poetry, yes, that I, I, um, I write both for the voice and for the page, but, but a certain trust that, um, I think both my Caribbean background as well, right? Like a, a, a trust of the kind of heightened rhetoric at times, um, even to our contemporary ears and our contemporary sensibilities can still, um, be compelling and resonate. Yeah. I've heard that there's like kind of like this period after the first book comes out where there ends up not being a lot of productive writing time during that period. And then that there's like almost like this feeling of loss mm -hmm. or like grief of the first book. And then like, I, what do you do? then like you have to get over it and then there's the hurdle and then you can start new work. I'm wondering how you're feeling about that now. Yeah, I'm having a, a in some ways similar and, and, and in other ways a distant, dissimilar experience. Um, I think because this book was a long time in coming, that to actually have it in the world, to actually hold it as a physical object, to actually be in conversation and, and doing readings and doing the work of promoting it actually feels like a, I, I understand that word grief, but it, 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 there is definitely like a, um, I remember when I, I had locks for a long time, when I first had a lock I would cut my hair. Like there's definitely that moment of, ooh, something is leaving me, something is separate from me. But my experience with this book and even with the locks, there's also like a like a shedding, a letting go that is actually a deep sense of relief. And the sense that, oh, now a space has has opened up that something new can, can rush in. So I've been busily taking notes and scribbling down ideas and jotting sparks and inspirations for more poems and what's a wonderful, um, impetus is that Tupelo has like rights of first refusal on a second collection. So that's a really wonderful impetus to, to write again. Now, having said that, also being a multi-hyphenate, 
Um, and theater was on hiatus for so much of, um, you know, 20, 2020 and 2021. And that sort of rushing back to life. And like you, I'm not a daily poet. I know I need sort of large blocks of time. So I'm looking ahead to um, carve out some writing space, like a good month somewhere down the line where I'm just writing and not auditioning and not accepting any acting work to really take these, the, the straw for the fire, as Theodore Rethke would say, right? To take the straw for the fire that I've been collecting and begin, um, a, um, a writing practice and hopefully generate a trove of first drafts that I can then, because I can revise while I'm doing other art practices, but I can't generate poems while I'm doing other art practices. That's what I've discovered. Yeah. That's interesting that, um, that the, that the creative impulse feels like that, that those two pistons can't be firing at the same amount of force that there's like, you know, creative output. Um, and then there's also revision, which, which revision is create very like creative, but it has more of that, like almost like analytical, like side. Um, and there is like a little bit of separation from that first spark of inspiration where you're just like, it's pure generating. Yeah. Um, yeah. I agree. I'm a lazy reviser. <laughs> Are you? Yeah, this is recorded now that I'm, I'm, I think I'm lazy. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm embarrassed about my revision process. <laughs> well, I mean, you also don't want to write, revise the poem out of existence, right? Like, yeah, the... yeah, yeah. Do, have you figured out a sense for, uh, because I know that poems can get over revised where it, it, now it's then it's like a dead limp thing in front of you and it's not alive anymore because you, you like messed with it too much. Yeah. So how, I, I'm wondering about this, like, have you figured out, um, is there like an internal barometer that you've, that you've come to for when you're like, oh, okay, like that, that last draft, we got to back up actually, like it's actually that draft. <laughs> um, <laughs> I or, so. or you're like, okay, this, this is done. <laughs> I can walk away from this. So yes and yes and no. I mean, I, I often quote, Sonia Sanchez would say to us, listen to a poem, listen to the poem, it will tell you what it needs. And then Audre Lorde's introduction to her collection Undersong, when her home in, on St. Croix was destroyed by a hurricane and she lost um, so much in her library and she came upon an early collection of poems and set about revisioning them. And she has this wonderful introduction where she talks about what it was like to, as a mature poet to return to some early poems and to revise and revision them, but really kind of stay uh, on the other side of rewriting the poems as the poet she was now would have written that poem. And both of those things, so I, for me, it's, it's a dance, right? So I feel like I know intuitively that kind of gut feeling when a poem feels done and really sort of discerning that from it's perfect, but there's a sense of, um, I don't know, sort of satisfaction, like a sense of, oh, okay, completeness, a sense of, huh, right? Um, which, doesn't, which doesn't mean that even when my collection was in galley, I wasn't still making, because even with that, even with the sending out, right, sometimes there's that word, like you just know you haven't quite found the right word, or there's still an image that kind of, uh, right? is is and so yeah, i still yeah. but it was it was really wonderful to be to have the manuscript accepted because that i think that level of acceptance then allowed me to focus in on some of just those tiny tiny polishing moments yeah i'm so excited yeah. that i found those and that my editors were so wonderful to allow me to make those changes um i keep all my drafts so i still tend to start longhand and then even when i start you know, I'm, I'm sort of an analog being, I'll still print out, unfortunately, or I definitely have tons of files. So yeah, if I feel like I've written something past, I can go back. Yeah, I can retrace my steps. Yeah, and that's absolutely. good, that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, there was a question in the chat, um, someone who knows your your acting work about if there's a, a plan for a revival of sweat. <laughs> yes, I saw that. <laughs> my dear friend, Heather, who um, saw the Canadian production of Sweat that I did 
And Heather, I have no idea if Theater Aquarius plans to redo that particular play. I've had the great joy of doing Sweat twice now, once in Cleveland, and um, it was great because Cleveland, you know, southern, southern part, you know, south of the Great Lakes, and then in Canada's historic steel town, Hamilton, um, north of the Great Lakes. So uh -huh. I don't know if I have any plans to do it again, but yeah, <laughs> but it is a great play. <laughs> Um, so are you actively auditioning for, for pieces? Are you part of a theater group? I don't know if that's the right way. Yeah, to... no, that's a great question. I'm, 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 I'm a bit of a hybrid. So I have not helped to, to found uh, a theater group or ensemble, but I've been very fortunate as an actor. I work, um, I have worked with theater making ensembles. For example, did this great mashup of Chekhov's The Seagull and Heiner Mueller's Hamlet Machine at La Mama back in the spring of 2018. As well, um, I do audition for regional and off-Broadway and one day, you know, Broadway production. So I'm, I'm a bit of both. And so, yes, I'm teaching this fall semester at Princeton. Um, and, and I know that I'll be, um, I'm slated to be doing a play in Washington, D.C. come next spring. And I'm actively auditioning. Um, I should know soon what exactly I'll be doing January and February. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. I'm wondering about Keats, John Keats's concept of negative capability and um, resting in the unknowing of, and the uncertainty and revision and, um, and how it seems like there are many unknowns in the world, at, you know, generally speaking right now, especially. How have you allowed that like unknowing in the drafting or revision process? Or have you thought about that at all? I, I for me, and this may be coming at it slant, so forgive me if I'm not yeah, yeah, yeah. directly to Keats' notion, but for me as an associative, as an associative thinker, as someone um, uh, drawn to collage and assemblage, even though I, 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 I have a narrative engine clearly, but I'm not a lyric, a fully lyric poet. Oh, I'm not yeah, a yeah. fully experimental poet. So for me, I think the unknowing and surprise comes into play in my work, sort of allowing myself to connect, connect seemingly, um, seemingly disconnected things, whether that's across time and space, whether that's across historical knowings, whether that's across different lived experiences that I've had, whether that's across different points on the map. And so that's yeah. something I really welcome and I've had a few poems where even where I've known that this is what I'm up to, to then be surprised that there's actually like historical precedence for this, this sort of poetic license that I took. Or for example, like as I shared with that incident that happened that morning in Ghana, that image, that morning was so compelling for me. I've tried a number of times to write that poem. I yeah. tried a number of times, as you said, to get A to lead to E and the poems just kind of fell apart yeah, or yeah. communicator didn't mean anything until that spring of 2020 where it was like, oh, it's because it's speaking in this other, whether it's a parable analogy or this larger metaphor in a way that now maybe the collective can participate, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, lo I love, I love that, um, that, you know, as poets and as, just as human beings walking around in the world and, but also if you're a poet, um, you end up like saving up the, those like mem like those images or those memories or those moments in your life. And it's, it's really fascinating when they come back. Like, cause I, I definitely have this poem that I've like tried to write, like, you know, this like childhood memory and I've tried it like, and I just feel like I'm getting it wrong every time, you know? And, um, and it's, it's fun to hear that something that, that there was a moment where like, it returned and it clicked. Um, yeah. yeah, that that poem was really beautiful, and I loved how it was almost circular too, because the moths the moths began the poem, and then the, they all, it also circled back to the moths at the end. Yeah. Are there other questions for um, our poet tonight? Oh, Lois says. Oh, of course, Lois. <gasps> Lois, I saw your Lo. Oh my gosh, this is. We'll talk about poets and the so Lois's. <laughs> Um, oh, the dear late David Budville, yes. right? Yes. Um, um, I was in a play of his um, 
at uh, Old Castle Theater in Bennington, Vermont. That's where it was. I've That's been having trouble remembering. And we had this wonderful, rich conversation. Uh, talk about vortex and convergences, right? Because, right. and I, I would love to, I often tell the story, but I'd love to tell the story here. And then I'll just jump ahead to say that when I was at VSC, David Budbill came and picked me up and took me to his home and we had a delicious meal, this delicious <laughs> soup, Lois, that you had made. And I got to see Lois's studio because Lois is a, you know, fabulous painter. visual artist and painter. And, Lo and David took me on a snowshoe walk um, at your place. Mm -hmm. And so spiraling back in time when David and I first met, so talk, speaking of auditioning, speaking of auditioning, Sarah, mm -hmm. I had not been in New York that long. So I was definitely, st you know, stomping the pavement and auditioning and going out for what they call equity principal auditions. And I walked into an equity principal audition for Old Castle Theater, mm -hmm. did a monologue audition. And a few weeks later, um, Eric Tucker, who was then the artistic director, calls me up and says, we'd love to offer you the role of um, uh, the nurse and um, the grandmother and uh, the attractive woman <laughs> in, um, this, in, in this wonderful uh, play by poet and playwright David Budbill. And I read the script and I was really excited, and, but I, I ask a lot of questions being a woman of color and an actor of color, artist of color. So I said to Eric Tuck, I said, how, I said, um, because it was sort of non-traditional casting, right? None of these roles, roles on the page were written specifically for a black woman to play. And I've done that, my career and my training have held both, and that's an important part of who I am. But I said to Eric, I said, um, um, how much non-traditional casting has your theater done? And he said, well, we'd like to do more. We haven't done that much. You know, it can be hard sometimes to convince folks to come to Southern Vermont to do a play. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's mm -hmm. great. I'd love to come. I said, but you do know it's not that challenging for your audiences to cast the nurse as a black woman. <laughs> so that's another reason I'm really excited that I get to play the grandmother in this flashback, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also the attractive woman. Mm -hmm. Then about... A week or so before we're supposed to start rehearsals, I get a new version of the script, which often happens with new plays, but all of a sudden, I'm not playing the grandmother in the flashback, and I'm not playing the attractive woman, I'm only playing the nurse. And certain lines have been changed to make it explicit that my character is black. And I was like, hold up, hold up, hold up. So I called up Eric, Eric, Tuck, Eric and I said, um, Eric Peterson, I'm misnaming him. I know another, theater director, Eric Tucker. This is being recorded. Eric Peterson, my apologies. <laughs> I called up Eric Peterson and I said, hey, hold up a minute. This is not what I agreed to. And something else is happening here. I'm no longer a part of the ensemble. Speaking of ensembles, right? Because the other characters doubled in these flashbacks. I was suddenly the only actor in the ensemble no longer doubling. And I said, and either this play is about race or it's not about race. Is the playwright going to change the line every time a different actor is cast to play this role of the nurse? And he said, okay, well, let me get back to David. And, I'll... and then David was there at the first day of rehearsal and everything had been reinstated. I was playing the grandmother. Mm -hmm. And then um, David would often, uh, not every rehearsal, but he would often come and sit in on rehearsals. And he was sitting up in the theater one day when we were doing the flashback scene. And this was, right? an autobiographical play, mm -hmm. and I was playing the grandmother. Mm -hmm. And then after the rehearsal, I went and sat next to David, and he said, Nehesayu, thank you. He said, thank you so much. I just saw my grandmother on stage. Mm -hmm. And I share, David knows, right, that I shared the story, and I said, David, that's what, that's what we do as actors. It's a transformative art form. Yes, with television and film, right, it's become the sort of representational but stage acting, theater acting, it's a transformative art form. That's our job, is to embody, is to channel, is to tell these stories. And the audience is capable, right, because it's an act of the imagination, of both seeing me and seeing the person being conjured. And then we had this wonderful conversation where he shared with me that the reason he had changed it was he thought he was helping to take care of me given some of what August Wilson had said about writing plays specifically for black actors. And of course, David shared with me that early in his career, he had been a faculty member at a historically black college. Mm -hmm. 
right. and had stayed in touch with one of his colleagues there. And so we had this really rich intergenerational conversation about what that generation had to fight so hard to make possible and what mm. we're now able to do. So mm. sorry, I'm just taking up all the airtime with that big story, <laughs> but Lois, thank you so much. Thank you so oh. much. Sure. Oh, I'm so glad to be here and see you again and, and hear you read. It's really great. <laughs> and share those memories. That's that's great. This has been so special. I I've been a fan of of David Budgel's poems, but I was never able to meet him. Did you see it? Did you find out through our mailing list? I did through an email. I'm, I'm oh, on your okay. email list. Okay. Yeah. Oh, great. That makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah. It's funny that things end up circling back in in unexpected, surprising, lovely ways. And that I've found that um, being able to stay connected through the Zoom world um, has its many pluses like this. Um, mm -hmm. It does. Nehas, I, would you mind closing with one more poem? Um, which poem to want to close with? Um, oh, well, I haven't read an explicitly Caribbean poem. And uh, this isn't um, a snowshoe walk, but it's another sort of walk. And um, in terms of the shape of the collection, there are also a, a few um, series that run through. And Undressing the River is one series. I walked up Canefield River in Dominica with a cousin, and we encountered, we had an encounter. Um, uh, and, that, and this poem comes from that series. So bear with me one moment. I'll just find the exact page that that poem is on. And I'll close with Undressing the River um, 2. This is actually uh, the second poem in the Undressing series. <sighs> Undressing the River 2. We want to spin our towels about us, but stand in the damp, a tintinabulation of ankle bracelets shifting, delicately rocking from one hemisphere to the other. Our bikini-clad hips are two red equators. The sun peeks through banana fronds, peeks through two copper keyholes of legs and coral pubic bone, peeks through the green-soaked signature of an island naming and renaming itself in the slow, dark ticking of tamarind pods. Wak tikabuli, wak tikabuli, in the pulsing flash of a cutlass, black tail switching side to side, to be hushed, to be locked in the shutters, stuttering cough. Are we a catch? Skin dripping with light, still. Sit still for the camera. Sweet dregs in a drum, under galvanized awnings or centuries shadow of stacked wooden stalls, women sit still. Hands deep in the knowledge of how to beat coarse cotton clean against the ragged rocks. How to wring provisions from volcanic ash. Cassava, dashin, edo, yam, we walk. The cow now behind us, occluded by a coconut palm, her tamarind eyes, her crown of horns, disappearing in a keyhole of green fire. Thank you for indulging us in reading a, a, a poem to close out this wonderful evening tonight. Um, Thank you, so good to see you. So good to see you as well. Thank you so much again, um, Sarah, again for inviting me. Of course, me. it's been such a pleasure. And pick up pick up music for Exile by Nehisayu Degans um, from your local independent bookstore or through bookshop. Um, we need to support our creative people, so if you are able to go get go get Nehisayu's book. <laughs> All right, everyone, have a great evening. Take care. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.